especially since this is the first speaker series that we've had uh, via Zoom. So uh, if it's a little bit bumpy, it's because we're still kind of getting used to the technology. But welcome, everybody. Uh, tonight, we're going to be speaking with uh, Ben Pearl, who's a biologist at uh, San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory. And he comes to us with special expertise with snowy plovers and least terns. Um, he, has, he has a pretty colorful background. Uh, his, his qualifications go out the door and around the block. Uh, he uh, has a uh, degree in ecology and evolutionary biology from University of, of uh, Santa Cruz. Uh, masters in environmental studies from San Jose State University, and he's been working with snowy plovers and least terns uh, in Eden Landing. And um, coincidentally, he did his project on snowy plover uh, winter foraging habits as part of his thesis in the South Bay. So he knows pretty much everything about uh, our beloved snowy plovers. And uh, we had originally, if you have been getting the Abbasid, we had originally scheduled a trip with Ben to take us on a walk and talk at Eden Landing um, this month. But of course, we had to postpone that and we're looking at possible dates in August. But we'll just see what happens with the public health recommendations and everybody's comfort level. But I certainly hope that can happen. Uh, that's when it happened last year. Uh, we had a walk and talk at Eden Landing with Ben um, in August and it was marvelous. So uh, perhaps that'll happen and we'll let you know. But um, we're going to record tonight's meeting and it'll be posted on our website and on our YouTube channel for everybody to view. Come back and, and uh, listen to or watch whenever they like. Anybody who's not here this evening will be able to do that. And we'll take a few questions toward the end. And uh, if you have a question, if you look at the bottom portion of your screen, you'll see the chat icon. You can click on the chat icon and you'll be able to enter a question there. Barry, uh, the new board president, will monitor the questions and toward the end, he'll read them off to Ben so Ben doesn't have to be distracted by the chat and uh, we'll, we'll have him answer a few questions. So without any further ado, I welcome you all again. I'm really looking forward to hearing Ben talk I, I loved going on the walk with him last year, and I hope soon that we can do it again soon. So take it away, Ben. All right, thank you very much, Matthew. And uh, first off, I'd like to say thank you to Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society for inviting me to speak tonight. It's hap I'm happy to finally uh, give a talk to y'all since uh, I live here. I live in Santa Clara, and we're we're based in uh, in Milpitas, and. You know, we do we do work in Alameda County and San Mateo County, but this is our home base. So glad I can can uh, talk to you guys tonight. So um, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and uh, get the presentation going. I've got a lot to go through. So give me one moment here. Oop. All right. So we're going to start this talk now. Just a quick little outline here. I'm going to go through the ecology of, of snowy plovers. I'll talk about some of the research and restoration that we've done um, at the San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory, as well as also go over some vo potential volunteer opportunities. Oh, great. Just a couple quick themes, too, to think about. Um, not necessarily any right or wrong answers, but they are what is restoration? How do we address urban wildlife habitat restoration? And also, how do we address restoration for multiple listed species that have incompatible habitat needs? So just think about these things as we go through. So just on a basic level, western snowy plovers, um, they're a small ground nesting shorebird. Um, they've got kind of a white chest, gray um, uh, kind of uh, upper parts. Um, they're about the height of, of a soda can and they weigh anywhere from 35 to, to 50 grams, which translates to somewhere between about five, five to eight, uh, five to 10 quarters. So just to give you a sense, very small, um, very light birds overall one of the smaller shorebirds um, here in North America. Now during the breeding season, adults can be differentiated by, by plumage. Um, so as you can see on the left, we have the male. Um, he's got the um, dark neck, crown, and auricular patches, as well as a little bit of a rusty cap. Um, you can just barely sort of see that differentiation. That typically only lasts um, during the first few months of the breeding season in March um, or in April. Um, whereas you look at the female, you can see some of those, those patches, but they're typically much lighter. 
Um, now I say that um, knowing that, you know, sometimes we have light males and dark females uh, just to make things interesting. Um, but of course, during the non-breeding season, uh, there's no way to differentiate between males and females. Most of those, those markings fade, um, unless of course they're color banded, but otherwise um, we lose the ability to really differentiate between these species um, or between these genders. Um, now one important thing to note is that uh, no matter what, um, snowy plovers are very cryptic. Their, their coloration um, and the type of habitats that they choose to, um, to forage, roost, breed, um, all really lend themselves to, to them blending into their environment to, to evade predators. Now their habitat um, along, the, um, along the coast is from uh, Southern Washington to Baja, California, and that's for the Pacific Coast population of snowy plovers. There is also an interior population, um, but this is considered a distinct um, population segment because there isn't really any, any gene flow, any breeding occurring between our birds on the coast and those that you would find in, in the Great Basin, for instance, in Great Salt Lake or Mono Lake or other places like that. Now there are some big differences range-wide uh, versus, versus the San Francisco Bay. Uh, most of the habitat across the range is, is dune backed sandy beaches, um, sometimes river bars like an eel, um, the Eel River in Humboldt County we had there were snowy plovers nesting for a while. Um, and then also there is natural salt pan habitat where snowy plovers do breed um, in, in various areas. Um, obviously in the San Francisco Bay, for the most part, we do not have sandy beaches, at least in the bay itself. But what we do have quite a lot of is, is salt pan um, that's found in, in former salt production ponds. Um, the, the levees that are associated with them and also um, dredge material that dries out and can provide appropriate habitat. Now, one thing that's important to remember is that Historically, um, most of the San Francisco Bay um, was wetlands. Um, there was not a lot of the, the type of habitat that, that snowy plovers need, which is um, dry and sparsely vegetated habitat. Obviously, you look at this picture, it's wet, it's, it's full of spartina. And it's mostly not the greatest habitat for snowy plovers. Now, there is evidence to suggest that um, there was some natural salt pan, especially in the kind of lower East Bay, Cremont, um, Union City, San Leandro, Newark area. Um, we know that you know the Ohlone used to harvest salt in those areas, and I think I think it's likely that there were some snowy plovers that that existed there, but but not a large population. Um, however, what happened in the mid 1800s um, with with a, a European settlement is that uh, we had kind of a large scale um, habitat change, and I'll talk more about this later. But essentially, we go from marsh to to salt ponds, and so as we go from not much snowy plover habitat to suddenly a lot. And what we've seen over that time is our snowy plover population uh, has grown quite a bit from what it likely was historically. Now, during the non-breeding season, they are partially migratory. So what this means is that um, some of them are going to remain around, around the Bay Area year-round. Uh, some will um, migrate elsewhere and return to the San Francisco Bay. Um, so we will also get you know, migrants coming from places as far away as, as coastal Oregon. Um, I even saw one bird um, during my master's thesis that came, had come from Utah. We do get the birds coming from the interior population um, to the coast, typically more in Southern California. So um, that was a surprise to see a bird from, from Utah, but still very cool. Um, and again, something to note, um, they do try to remain cryptic. So they're hanging out here on a beach in a loose flock along the beach rack, but um, typically they're gonna, they're gonna be pretty hard to spot. Um, th in this case, they're not too tough to spot, but they really do try and blend in throughout their life history. Same story, um, this is a, on a salt pond um, in, in Eden Landing. Um, we've got some oyster shells mixed in here and, and I'll talk a lot about those in just a little bit. But again, um, they do try and choose substrates that, that are similar coloration and, and help them to, to blend in. Now during the breeding season, the adults share incubation duties. Um, so as you can see on the picture on the left, we've got a female sitting on a nest. We can tell based upon um, her, her plumage. Um, and then on the picture on the right, we've got a male. Um, and you can tell again because of the, the darker plumage that you see on this male. So basically females incubate during the day, males are off foraging nearby, and then at nighttime they switch um, or kind of near, near the end of the day, and males will incubate at night, and then they'll, they'll switch off at some point um, in the morning. Now snowy plovers are, are pretty unique uh, in the fact that they have a polyandrous mating system. So what this means is that, like I said, males and females are going to share incubation duties, um, the eggs will hatch. Um, the female may remain around for a few days, um, but 
after that, she's actually going to abandon, um, pair up with another male, sometimes in the, in the nearby area, but other times as far away, I think it's been documented as far as maybe 150 miles away, away she might migrate to and, and, and pair up again um, with another, another male and start a new nest. So males are actually the ones who raise snowy plover chicks. You can see that on the bottom left corner. We've got the, the dark coloration of the male with these three young precocial chicks. Um, and then also on the right here, we've got a male that's, that's brooding one, um, one chick underneath them. Now typically nests um, are a one to three egg clutch with three being the most common. Um, four very, very occasionally, um, but typically when it's four, um, at least one of them is not viable. Um, again, uh, very cryptic coloration. They, they choose substrates and they choose um, uh, habitats that really help their eggs to blend in. Um, so certainly they blend in well with, with salt and with salt pan. And they can get very creative where they put their nests. So um, this picture on the left here, we have a, a footprint. Um, somebody, somebody had trespassed and had walked barefoot through, um, which I would not necessarily recommend. Um, but it does provide nice habitat. And it's actually something that we purposefully do. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but it's called a, a mud stomp to create some footprints for, for snowy plover nesting. Um, I also mentioned we, we have oyster shells um, that, we, that we've spread, and I'll talk more about that. Normally, they're more to sort of break up the habitat, but inevitably every year we have some snowy plovers that put their eggs right in the oyster shells. And then lastly, as, as some of you may know, um, there is hunting allowed during the winter time um, at both Don Edwards as well as Eden Landing. And this is here in the bottom, we have a duck decoy that, that just degraded it over time and eventually provided um, a nice place for the snowy plover to, uh, to lay its nest. Typically, they, they try and find um, a nest location that has some other features that's gonna help sort of break up um, the habitat so that their eggs don't stand out quite as much. Now, chicks are precocial. Now, what this means is that um, within hours of hatching, um, they are, are walking on their own. They're going to be feeding themselves. They are going to, you know, rely upon, upon the male to, um, to brood them, to keep them warm because they're so small, um, and also to lead them to, um, to foraging grounds and to, to help them survive. He may, he may kind of give the call and they'll duck down, come back up when he, when he, when he you know, lets them know that, it, that it's safe. But um, they're, they're definitely very vulnerable to start. Um, for the first two weeks, um, very, very reliant upon, upon the male. Um, at about two weeks, they, they, they start to get their pin feathers coming in and um, they become much more capable of running away from, um, from predators rather than, than simply hiding. So early on, they've got this sort of salt and pepper um, cryptic coloration. Um, when predators approach, they're gonna just hunker down on the ground, hope that you don't see them and pop up once, once you go away. Um, after that point, they just, they'll start running all around. And they typically will fledge anywhere from 28 to 33 days. Um, it really depends, but um, definitely by 28 days, we see them starting to, you know, test out their wings. Um, and then you can see um, on the far right, we've got a, we've got a fledgling, um, kind of similar with other with other birds. You can you can tell that it's a fledgling just kind of based on um, kind of the drab nature of of the plumage, the fact that it's sort of kind of not quite um, completed, um, not fully um, colored in. Now there are certainly a lot of reasons for the decline, but but predators are are, are a main one. Um, this includes everything from raptors like peregrine falcons, which, which have recovered quite well, um, as I'm sure you all know in the San Francisco Bay and, and now pose, um, you know, certainly a challenge for, for them in their recovery. Um, mammals like the, the red fox, um, which, um, you know, is, is a bit confusing. At one point I thought that they were all um, invasive, um, but they are in fact native to a large amount of North America, including uh, the Sacramento Valley. And as some of you may be aware, the Sierra Nevada red fox, which is one of the um, one of the more rare mammals in, in, in North America. But in any case, um, red foxes have gradually colonized um, the San Francisco Bay and the coast. Um, they've facilitated by, by human presence, and I think also a lack of, 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 of other top predators. And so they've definitely caused a lot of problems for, for ground nesting shorebirds and other, other ground nesting species. And of course, we also have to mention corvids. They're, they're obviously very smart. Um, common ravens were, were once rare. Um, in the San Francisco Bay, and, and now they, they are probably um, one of our most common predators that, that we see um, in the San Francisco Bay. Um, they're they're um, very smart, very, uh, you know, tough to, um, you know, uh, to, to outsmart, so they're, they're constantly keeping us um, on our toes, um, and uh, there's, there's certainly something that, that you'll hear about more later. 
Of course, we also have to mention, mention California gulls. Um, as many of you likely know, um, California gulls are a, a species that formerly did not breed um, in the San Francisco Bay. It was not until, I believe, uh, 1981 that um, about 50, 50 individuals, I believe, were, were found breeding um, in the South Bay. Um, and uh, SFBBO has been monitoring their population ever since then. Um, I believe, well, we weren't able to do our, our California goal count this past year, but last year was, was close to 50,000 goals. So it's quite the, quite the population growth in, in a little bit less than 40 years. Um, and the big problem for, with goals is, um, for one, they're very resourceful. Um, obviously, they're able to um, make use of, of, of landfills to, to get extra sources of food. Um, they also are, are fairly adept at, at um, taking um, shorebird chicks, um, some studies in, in the mid-2000s found that um, some California gulls, a huge proportion of their diet during the summer was, was avocet chicks. So unfortunately, they can have big effects on, on avocets, on, on stilts, um, and certainly on snowy plover eggs and chicks as well. And then also, um, in some cases, they might be using habitat that otherwise, otherwise might be used by, by breeding snowy plovers or, or avocets or stilts or, or maybe even forester spring. So um, certainly an issue as well. And then of course, disturbance uh, is, is a major issue. As I mentioned, snowy plovers, um, they need kind of bare, um, sparsely vegetated areas uh, to nest. Um, and something really important about them is the way that they evade predators is by running and hiding um, when a predator approaches um, the nest. So as far away um, as 600 feet, snowy plovers will flush off their nest. So that way, hopefully for them, uh, whatever predator is won't know that the eggs are there and will just kind of keep going. Um, now, obviously, when you look at, at, at a beach, a very busy beach, there just isn't space for, for them to, to, you know, to kind of have the room that they need in order to nest. So unfortunately, snowy plovers have abandoned um, over half of their historical breeding sites along the coast in California. Um, this, does all, this also um, has the same effect, um, you know, when we're talking about trails in the bay. Um, it's also important to note that, um, you know, dogs are certainly a big issue, especially on the coast. Um, and even if dogs aren't actually attacking, um, snowy plovers, they are going to um, cause them to use up, um, you know, extra energy, whether we're talking about wintering plovers or if we're talking about, about breeding plovers, it can have especially big effects. And unfortunately, this, this picture here in the bottom right um, was, was in fact a, a, from, from a dog that did attack and, and unfortunately killed his chicks. So um, when, when you do go to beaches and you see that, that you know, there's no dogs allowed or, or that dogs must be unleashed, um, it's, it's, um, it's for a good reason. They, they, do, they do have a big effect on these snowy plovers. Of course, habitat loss um, is, is also a major, major issue. Uh, we talk about invasive plants. Um, on the coast, it's, it's European beach grass. Um, and European beach grass is, is interesting for a few different reasons. For one, um, because it's so tall, it's going to, um, or tall and, and kind of dense, it's going to affect the ability of, of snowy plovers um, to actually see predators. They, they need sparsely vegetated areas in order to have good visibility and to detect predators approaching. If they can't detect predators approaching, it's, it's an area that they're likely going to, um, to, to avoid nesting in. And then other than that, it actually also will kind of reshape how the dunes form. It'll make them steeper and again, make, make it lower quality habitat for them. Now we don't have European dune grass, but we do have uh, slender leaf ice plant um, here in the San Francisco Bay. Um, it doesn't obstruct their view, um, but it actually does something um, not quite as obvious. It, it, for one, it covers up a lot of area, um, but it actually makes snowy plovers stand out a lot more when they're on a pond. They'll still nest um, nearby it and in it, but they really do stand out a lot more against, against the, the uh, red and green um, of, of this ice plant um, compared to if the pond bottom really had not much vegetation. Climate change, of course, is something that, that we really have to consider and is um, something that everyone's looking at more and more. Um, sea level rise, uh, obviously there's a lot of projections, but some say one to two meters by the year 2100, um, kind of analogous to, to a king tide. So I have a picture here of, of a king tide at the uh, Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk. Um, not a beach, not a snowy plover breeding habitat, but, but basically what I'm trying to show you here is, you know, this is normally a pretty big beach. Um, but during a king tide, there's, there's really almost no beach left. Um, and so this is going to be a really big issue, um, not only for snowy plovers along the coast, because there, there isn't a whole lot of, of room for, for the beach to migrate. You know, we have a built up environment next to beaches, and so uh, the beaches can't, you know, can't be pushed back um, very much. 
but also in the San Francisco Bay. You know, most of the habitat for snowy plovers is found in, in former salt production ponds. Um, water levels are managed with, with water control structures. The higher water levels rise, the more difficult or, or potentially impossible it will be to, to manage those water levels. So it'll certainly affect us here as well. Now, for all of these reasons, uh, snowy plovers have been listed as federally threatened under the Endangered Species Act since 1993. This provides them protection throughout the year, whether you're talking during, during the breeding season. And as we can see, this is um, a sign on the left from, I believe, Half Moon Bay. Um, you know, there's, there's kind of symbolic fencing and, and just a warning that, you know, snowy plovers are protected and there are, you know, uh, potential fines and jail time. Um, I think for the most part, people do, do follow signs, unfortunately not always. Um, and then even here in the, in the San Francisco Bay during the winter, um, this, this one on the right is from Crown Beach in Alameda. Um, there's a nice wintering flock that has, that has formed there um, because an area was, was roped off for them and they're protected even during the winter um, from, from harassment to kind of help them through, through the winter time. Now across the coast, um, you can see that, you know, the population has been climbing um, up to about 2,400 adults in, um, in 2018. I haven't seen the data yet for 2019 or for this year just yet. So we can see this upward trend and the, the range wide goal is actually 3000 uh, birds. Um, and actually interesting to note that uh, based on some correction factors kind of factoring in, you know, that we, you know, we're not able to actually detect all the birds. Um, we do, you know, do these surveys uh, across the coast at the same time, but, it, but we still miss some birds. But based upon that correction factor, um, US Fish and Wildlife believes that um, potentially in 2018, we did hit that number of 3,000. Um, now, from what I do know of the, of the numbers in 2019 and, and 2020, um, the numbers have um, gone down a bit. Certainly um, in our area, they have a bit, as, as, as we'll see. Um, but that is at least a little bit of good news. Now, in order to facilitate recovery of, of western snowy plovers across the Pacific coast, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife broke up the, the coast into um, six different recovery units. Um, and each, each recovery unit has, has various goals depending upon uh, how much suitable habitat um, and uh, how much you know, kind of potential there is for, for supporting, supporting snowy plovers. So we are in recovery unit three, um, which includes uh, actually the nine counties of the San Francisco Bay, um, but really the majority of snowy plover breeding occurs um, south of the San Mateo Bridge. Um, so we call everything um, south of that area of the South Bay. Um, so the most important site by far um, for snowy plovers in the Bay Area is, is Eden Landing Ecological Reserve. That's um, where any given year, um, anywhere from 50 to 75 percent of all of all breeding activity occurs um, at Eden Landing. Aside from that, uh, there's also um, a lot of activity spread out throughout Don Edwards, San Francisco Bay National Wildlife Refuge. Um, the most important site of, 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 of Don Edwards is the Ravenswood Ponds, which are um, at the base of the Dumbarton Bridge on, um, in Menlo Park. Um, aside from that, there is, there is also a good amount of nesting that occurs um, in Alviso. Um, really kind of depends year to year. Uh, the Warm Springs Ponds in, in Fremont, um, a little bit of activity in the Dumbarton Ponds next to the Refuge Headquarters in Fremont, and then there is also some activity in, um, in the Cargill Production Ponds and, and Maori Ponds next to them as well. And then as I mentioned, there is also a small amount of habitat in the North Bay. I uh, just want to mention that real quick. There's some breeding activity in the Napa Sonoma Marshes Wildlife Area, um, Hamilton Wetlands in, in Novato, and then lastly, the Montezuma Wetlands um, kind of near, near Fairfield and, and Swano um, in Sassoon Bay. So a typical day, uh, we're out doing data collection. Uh, we're, we're doing surveys and basically we, we try and count all the plovers on site. We record their location on a map and we identify potential nest locations. Now this is what an incubating female looks like. We can tell that she's incubating um, for a couple reasons. Uh, for one, if you look at, at uh, kind of her backside, you can see that her tail is sort of pushed up, kind of an indication that she's, that she's sitting on, on eggs. Um, if, if we could see the kind of bigger picture, you'd see that there's, there's not gonna be any other plovers nearby. Um, they definitely do not tolerate other plovers uh, close to their nest while it's active. So, so if there were other plovers nearby, she would potentially get up and chase them off. Um, I would also notice that she's alert, she's looking around, 
and she'll occasionally stand up, kind of readjust and sit back down on the eggs and kind of do a characteristic wiggle. Um, now when we see that, uh, we do want to go out and find the nest locations. And what we actually do is we go out and float the eggs. And, and this is a method that, that actually allows us to determine um, when they were laid um, and how far, they, they, how far away they are from hatching. So when they are first hatched, um, the eggs sit at the bottom of the water. Um, they'll, grab, they'll sit at a point and they'll gradually kind of start to, to, to sit straight up. So we'll measure, um, we'll, we'll estimate the, the degrees that they're in the water. Uh, eventually, they'll float above the water column and we'll actually measure um, with a ruler the, the amount of millimeters that they're sitting above the water. We'll get to about 20 millimeters max and then they'll, they'll start to, to the hatching process, process which takes anywhere from three to five days. Um, and this is really important for a few reasons. For one, um, it allows us to determine nest bait. So if we, if we find a nest one week, uh, we come back the next week and it's gone. And we know that the eggs were all sitting at zero degrees, just laid um, the prior week. We know that the nest had to have been, been depredated. There's no, there's no chance that it hatched. Um, however, if, um, if, the, if the nest was, was floating high the week prior um, and we come back and, and you know, the eggs are gone, um, we know that there's a chance of it hatched. And, and if that's the case, what we'll actually do is we'll, we'll look at the lining within the nest. There's a small amount of material that they'll place in the nest and we'll look for small eggshell fragments. Um, and what happens basically during the half shell process, small hatch um, eggshells will, will kind of fall down to the bottom of the nest scrape. And um, when we find those, those really small fragments, that's an indication that, that the eggs hatched. Of course, we also sometimes want to, to color band. And in those instances, we really need a time um, when we go out to the nest to, uh, to band um, based upon when they hatch because they're precocial, they're going to leave the nest um, not that long after they hatch. Um, so we catch them at the nest. Um, each chick gets a unique four color combo. Um, this is really important for us because we're working in a, in, a, in a really big area. It's tough to keep track of the broods. And so um, we give every chick um, a unique combination Sometimes other, other areas will give each chick the same combo, but uh, we really would have a tough time in, in keeping track of them. So here we have actually a, a, a snowy plover chick um, that, that I banded last year at Eden Landing um, at Pond D14 that I'll talk a bit more about. Um, but this is a chick that um, I did confirm that he had fledged or that it had fledged um, in, I believe, early July last year. Uh, didn't see it again around Eden Landing. And then in early January, I actually got a um, I got a, a message through a snowy plover listserv um, that had that uh, the, the director from Audubon Canyon Ranch had observed um, our, our snowy plover um, out at, um, at Point Reyes um, as, as, a, as a full adult. So um, always fun to see. Um, we have these pictures of chicks as, you know, kind of when we first banded them and then kind of as an adult. Um, I haven't seen them yet this year, but uh, hopefully um, we'll show up as a breeder some point soon. And then just for a little bit more local, um, the other thing that color banding, um, well, I, I should have mentioned color banding is, is important for a few reasons. For one, it helps us to um, know about um, fledging success. So we wanna know how many chicks survive to become adults. Um, it also is important for migration. And then in, in this instance, as we'll see, it's, it can kind of provide some cool information about natal site fidelity. And then what this means is the, the, the likelihood or the, the degree to which um, a, individuals will return to where they first um, uh, were hatched. So in this case, um, at Crittenden Marsh, um, in 2018, I banded um, three chicks, uh, one of which was black over aqua and aqua over green. You're going to read it uh, top over bottom on the left leg, top over bottom on the right. Um, he was determined to have fledged um, in August 2018 along with one of the other chicks. Um, in 2019, he returned to Crittenden Marsh and, and had a nest um, about 100 meters away from, from where he hatched out. Um, not a huge site, as, as I'm sure many of you know, but, but still I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and his three chicks hatched. I was able to ban them. Um, unfortunately, this one in, in my hand was the only one that was confirmed to have fledged. Um, and then again this year, he, he returned. So he started the first nest of the, of the, of the season at Crittenden Marsh. Um, it hatched. Um, it, again, was pretty close to where he had hatched. Um, and just uh, last week, I, I observed him. I wasn't able to ban the chicks. They, they hatched a little bit earlier than I expected, but I observed him with, with one older chick. Um, he had eventually moved over to the, to the triangular um, pond um, directly next to Crittenden Marsh um, with one chick that's, that's close to fledging. And I'll, I'll be visiting there tomorrow and hopefully I will, I will, I will see a, a fledged chick with them. 
Now, sometimes we do want to ban adults, and obviously you can't just walk up and ban an adult. So um, what, you, what we do is actually use noose mats. And what these are is essentially um, strips of, of uh, wire mat that have a lot of um, nylon loops tied to them. And uh, what we do is we'll, we'll place these around the nest, either when, when it's still in the egg stage or potentially if, if there's chicks, we can, um, we can um, catch the chicks. Um, have them in a banding bag with, with, with a warmer if needed and, and go and hide and hope that the adult um, returns back to the nest. Um, sometimes they, 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 they walk across. Um, unfortunately, because we can't hide the noose mats, it's a little bit more obvious compared to, um, to a sandy beach where we could sort of um, kind of cover some of that metal, metal stuff. But still, we've been able to band a few adults this year. Um, and again, we do get, um, uh, we band them with a four color combo that's specific. Um, on the right is um, black over orange, green over yellow. Um, this is an adult that we banded um, at Pond SF2, um, also in the Ravenswood Ponds in Menlo Park. Um, haven't seen him um, confirmed breeding since. I think he was banded in 2016, but he is known to winter um, both in Ocean Beach and um, in Chrissy Fields in San Francisco. Um, he's probably my favorite um, color banded bird. Um, and I don't know if any of you can, can guess why, but um, I am a sports fan, so that's that's the reason why I like to call him Bay Area Baseball Bird, and I'll let I'll let y'all decide uh, which which colors you like the best personally. So, as far as in the San Francisco Bay, um, during the winter our population actually is bigger. Um, like I mentioned, we um, with some of our some of our breeders are going to leave, but we have an influx of of snowy plovers coming in from the interior population. So we can see overall we have observed um, a positive trend. Um, in snowy plovers, um, kind of close to, to 400 um, in recent years. Um, and as far as in Santa Clara County, uh, wintering plovers really depends on habitat. Um, now, as, as many of you know, um, the, the ponds where snowy plovers, um, you know, breed, roost, and forage um, are managed during the summer um, to provide some habitat for them. And, and during the winter, most of them are going to be flooded up to provide habitat for um, either for ducks or for, for medium to large sized shorebirds. Um, so as a result, it really depends on, on conditions each year, um, uh, how many snowy plovers there might be. Um, if you're wondering, uh, wondering what happened in the winter of 2016, um, Pond A12 was, was kept dry throughout the winter. So that's where we get our um, close to 140 um, snowy plovers that year. But as you can see, it's pretty variable um, in terms of where snowy plovers are found. Um, just to sort of uh, give a little bit more context, um, Alviso is referring to the ponds that are um, next to Alviso Marina County Park and the EEC. Um, those are all part of the Alviso complex um, of Don Edwards. Uh, Mountain View still does include um, ponds that are, that are part of the Alviso complex um, along that area and Stevens Creek, but it also does include um, Crittenden Marsh, which is, which is a mid pen and, and NASA property. Now, as I mentioned, our, our snowy plover population in the San Francisco Bay um, is much smaller during the breeding season. Um, but you can see overall, we have been on an over, upward trend over the past um, you know, 17 years. Uh, when, when we first began monitoring in 2003, um, there was only 72 um, snowy plovers counted. Um, we reached a high of 275 in 2010. Um, unfortunately, last year, um, we, we counted 190. And, and unfortunately, I don't have a full count this year. Um, due to COVID-19 and, and not having access to some of our sites. Now, this is good overall to see a positive trend, but unfortunately, um, our, our recovery goal for the entire San Francisco Bay is 500 adults. So we're at best about halfway to that goal. And I should note, um, basically, um, across the entire Pacific Coast, um, all the snowy plover biologists do a breeding window survey um, in the middle of May during a specific time. And, and it's kind of uh, assumed that whichever, whichever birds are in, the, in, in, you know, in a given recovery unit are the breeders from that area. And that way we're kind of limiting any sort of double counting by kind of taking a snapshot across the entire coast. And again here, just let's take a look at our, at our snowy plovers um, here in Santa Clara County. Um, you can see that, that it's, it's pretty variable, um, you know, depending upon the year, depending upon how much habitat is available. Um, sometimes during May, we, we found zero. Um, snowy plovers breeding, and sometimes we found over 20. Um, most of the time they're, they're in um, these Alviso ponds that I mentioned. Sometimes um, they're in the Mountain View ponds, uh, mostly in Crittenden Marsh, but on, on some years we've also had some activity um, in A3N, which is um, 
uh, a pawn that's close to the public, but it's out across from a6, um, for, for if that rings a bell for anyone. And obviously, um, well, not obviously, but um, there's more activity than, than we, we might see just in May because uh, snowy clover breeding season extends from March all the way through, um, through uh, the end of September. Um, and so I thought it might be helpful to see actually um, a count of nests um, in, Santa, in Santa Clara County. Um, so, so the blue is Santa Clara County nests for, for each season and the red is, is the rest of the San Francisco Bay. So you can see Santa Clara County doesn't make up a huge percentage um, of, of snowy plover nesting within the San Francisco Bay, but it certainly is consistent. There's breeding every year. Um, in some years, there's, there's more than others. Um, and I should also mention that, um, you know, a lot of the habitat that we have um, is, is pretty hard to survey. It's really big ponds. Um, you know, in some cases, they're, they're kind of soft and dangerous to walk on. Um, those ponds uh, next to the Alvisa Marina County Park, A12, A13, A15, um, those are some of our, our, our probably our least favorite uh, to walk on. They're, they're, just, they're, they're just really soft, uh, not, not really the best for, for walking on, and, and because of the sort of shape of them can make it tough to, to even find breeding clovers. So real quickly, I have a, uh, a video of uh, banding snowy plovers um, out of Eden Landing. Um, you will mostly hear snowy plover adults uh, making some noise, trying to um, distract us, to lead us away. They'll be doing a broken wing, they'll be vocalizing, whatever they can to, to, to get us to, to, to leave them in their chase alone. That's the reason for all the fuss. Oh, one more time. All right, so quick pop quiz. Just want to see how much you guys were listening. So approximately how many breeding snowy plovers were found in the Bay Area prior to European settlement? I'll give you all a second. You can enter your, your answers in the chat. All right, well, you guys had a little bit of time. So the answer is, if it'll, if it'll do this, come on. It's unknown, um, likely a small population um, due to the limited habitat. Um, so next question, why have snowy plovers declined throughout the range? And there's a lot of answers, so. Pardon me one moment. All right, so a lot of answers here. Predators, invasive vegetation, disturbance, competition with other species. And lastly, how do snowy plovers try to avoid predators? And if predators are nearby, what do plovers do? I should take this moment to, to note, um, we at SFBBO are, are plover rovers. Some people are plover lovers. Um, totally fine, whichever you are. Um, I don't know that there's really a correct pronunciation. I can tell you when, um, when all the plover biologists get, get together across the coast, we can't agree. So if, if you never, if you always are confused about that, it's fine either way. But in any case, so snowy plovers are cryptic at all life stages. Um, they'll flush off the nest from a far distance and they'll use things like broken wing displays and vocalizations to try and distract predators. So Moving on. So let's talk a little bit more about habitat in the South Bay. So historically, um, as I mentioned, uh, much of the South Bay was a huge network of, of tidal marsh. Um, now gradually over time, you know, a ton of people started moving to the San Francisco Bay for, um, for the, the gold rush and then they kind of settled in. And eventually, you know, there was, there was kind of good conditions for making salt. And so gradually people started making salt ponds and what we, we go from this sort of tidal marsh from the mid 1800s to present day, we have just a, a kind of a large network of, of salt production ponds with, with a very small amount of, of tidal marsh remaining. Um, now gradually over time, um, most of these ponds were um, you know, sold to different companies and eventually 
Um, Cargill became the, the owner of, of all of these lands. Um, at a certain point, they decided they didn't actually need all this, this habitat or all this land to produce their salt. Um, so in the early 2000s, they, they sold their land to U.S. Fish and Wildlife and California Fish and Wildlife. And with that, the South Bay Salt Pond Restoration Project was born. Now, this is actually the largest wetland restoration project on the West Coast. Um, the goal is to restore um, up to 15,000 acres of salt pond habitat uh, back to tidal marsh. And it uh, sounds pretty simple. You essentially just open up the pond to tidal action and vegetation will grow and you'll eventually have a marsh. Obviously, it's, it's not quite that simple for, for a number of reasons. Um, we, have, we have legacy mercury in some of our ponds. Um, we have a lot of species that have come to rely upon them. We have infrastructure. So it's, it's much more complex than that. Um, it's been going on since, since 2003, and it's going to be at least a 50-year project. So, so there's a lot more work to do. Um, we're kind of in the first part of, of, of phase two of the project um, with active construction currently um, at, at Bedwell Bayfront Park um, in Menlo Park next to the Ravens with Ponds. Now, there are going to be impacts um, due to tidal marsh restoration. Some of them are going to be, are going to be good. We're going to have, um, obviously, increased tidal marsh habitat, which is, which is really important for, for our two, um, two of our endemic um, endangered species here, the, the Ridgeways Rail and the Salt Marsh Harvest Mouse. Um, it will improve environmental health um, and resiliency to climate change because, because tidal marsh um, is good at soaking up water and cleaning it and um, kind of guarding against sea level rise. And then, of course, it's also helping to facilitate um, the completion of the San Francisco Bay Trail. So as more of the, of the project is completed, that Bay Trail is, is getting filled in more and more. So for these species and for these purposes, it's, it's tidal marsh restoration is a good thing. Now, what tidal marsh restoration will also do is, is decrease some of the current types of habitat. Um, so it's, it's going to result in less uh, dry pond breeding habitat for, for Western snowy plovers, as we talked about. Um, California least terns are species I'm going to talk a, a bit more a uh, bit more about in just a little bit, but they have pretty similar habitat needs to, to western snowy plovers. They need uh, dry, sparsely vegetated habitat, which is why they've ended up breeding um, in the salt ponds and similar type areas. And then you also have birds like uh, black neck stilts and American avocets, um, forster's terns, species which actually historically did not really breed much in the San Francisco Bay. It's a kind of an interesting situation we have where. Um, you know, snowy plovers and least terns lost their habitat on the coast. Um, and then avocets, stilts, um, these other breeding birds, they lost a lot of their breeding habitat in, in the Central Valley. And so these, these, uh, these salt ponds provide some, some alternative habitat they've come to really rely upon. Um, now, aside from that, I'm sure you all know um, how important the, the San Francisco Bay is um, along the Pacific Flyway um, for both migratory um, and wintering shorebirds and waterfowl. Um, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of both um, shorebirds and waterfowl use the San Francisco Bay. Um, and some of them really are only found in, in the ponds. Um, that's, you know, especially ruddy ducks are really um, mostly found in ponds. Um, also, phalaropes really use the, the salty ponds. Um, and so we could have some negative impacts to, to all these different species. Now, obviously, the project recognized that. And so one way that um, they tried to address that early on was by reconfiguration. Now this, this is pond SF2, it's at, right at the base of, of the Dumbarton Bridge in Menlo Park. So just outside Santa Clara County, but pretty close. But in any case, what they did is they, they reconfigured the pond. So on one side you have nesting islands. These nesting islands currently provide uh, breeding habitat for, for Caspian terns, um, uh, elegant terns, least, or not even least terns, uh, Forster's terns, avocets, stilts, um, there was actually a couple black oyster catchers nesting there last year. Um, so a lot of different birds use the habitat. Um, and then the back area was left as snowy clover habitat. Um, it's specifically managed to be dry. Um, there's a small amount of oyster shells that we spread there. Um, so this is one way to try to, um, you know, kind of provide habitat for all these different species um, in a smaller footprint. Another way that, that the project has tried to provide for, for these species is, is through oyster shell enhancement. Uh, this is um, a method that's been used elsewhere, um, but also certainly um, we had done a lot of pilot, pilot um, uh, plots and studied um, snowy plovers' um, use of these pilot plots, various places even landing. And, and after studying our results, we found that snowy plovers preferred them um, and that they did well um, compared to, to non-shelled areas. And so what we did is we spread um, over 20 hectares of oyster shells on one pond in Eden Landing. 
Um, this is a huge amount of oyster shells, a really big area on this pond in E14. And, and our goal was really to create, create some high quality um, and dense breeding habitat that would help increase their, their camouflage and cover. Now here is a picture of a female snowy plover sitting on a nest. Um, one thing you can see here is these are actually really large oyster shells. We were fortunate to um, receive these um, oyster shells. Um, they were donated by Drake's Bay um, before Drake's Bay was closed down. Um, so one of the good things about these shells that came from them is that um, they grew them really large before they would shuck them and, and, and can them. And so these oyster shells are almost about the same size um, you know, height-wise as a snowy plover in some cases. So they really can provide some nice, nice uh, sort of blending in uh, camouflage. You can see though, as you back out, you know, snowy plover sitting amongst all these oyster shells uh, certainly made our job a lot harder in terms of uh, trying to locate nests. And our, our hope was that it would do the same uh, for predators. So based upon uh, this nest with our, our nest locations, you can see that it was effective. We have attracted a lot of snowy plovers to nest in this pond. I have one more video real quick to show you guys. And you listen at the very end, for those of you who are familiar with the call of a least turn, you will hear some least turns calling right at the end. And you can see this snowy plover much better this time. So real quick game here. We've got some snowy plover chicks who are on this screen. I'll give you a moment, see if you can find any of them. Let's just show you how well they blend in. All right, first one. And number two. So they really do blend in. Obviously this is, you know, this is a, a camera trap picture. You know, quality is maybe not the best, but it still still kind of shows you how well they can blend in. Again, here we have at least one snowy plover chick, and, and I should note here what what we're seeing is actually an adult uh, running off with eggshell. Um, this is pretty typical of of ground nesting birds. When when the chicks hatch, um, they will they will pick up the eggshells and actually run and and discard them um, well away from the nest, so as not to um, lead predators um, to the nest potentially right there and obviously that one's pretty easy right there <laughs> and the adult incubating probably another chick um, sometimes the nests hatch synchronously um, but what, what we see especially when the weather gets hot towards the end of the season um, we'll have eggs that are hatching sometimes a day and a half apart so we'll have a uh, you know chick on camera walking around foraging and it takes forever until the, the, the rest of the chicks actually hatch out. So in any case, let's get down to the data. So let's look at our oyster shell enhancement. The year before um, we spread shells at E14, um, we had 54 nests. Um, and what we, what we found of these 54 nests is that only 33% of them hatch. This is pretty poor. Um, you know, we want to see at least a 50% hatch rate. So the first year that we spread oyster shells was 2015. Um, we had 98 nests in the pond that year, so we, we almost doubled the, the amount of nests in the pond. And again, our hatch rate almost doubled. So um, a really good year um, for the most part for, for snowy plovers in this pond. The one thing that we did have is um, some peregrine falcons that were, that were nesting uh, in, the, in the pond directly next to, to, to this pond. Um, they were they're, uh, nesting in an old hunting blind. Um, and this is actually uh, an example of a nest that um, when, we sh when, we, when we showed up, uh, we looked at the, the, the nest scrape, and based upon the, um, based upon the, the, the eggshell fragments, we, we thought that this nest had hatched. However, when we, um, when we looked back at the nest camera footage, we realized that, that these chicks had been taken directly out of the nest by these peregrine falcons. Um, if you look back at the hunting blind, you actually see the second adult is perched on there as well. So, in 2016, we were hoping that we would see more of the same. We had 88 nests, so still quite a lot of nesting activity. Um, for context, um, you know, there's typically around somewhere to 200, 250 nests um, in all of the San Francisco Bay. So this pond is representing, you know, a really huge chunk of snowy plover breeding activity. Um, the problem is, if you look at our hatch rate, it, it really was abysmal. 
um, it was you know about 25%. So um, started to become really worried um, that we were attracting a lot of plovers and and just kind of leading them to a death trap. And in this situation, um, our our culprit is, is ravens. So again, we had 88 nests. Um, 60 of them were depredated. We had camera traps that recorded um, the depredation event in 30 cases. All of those 30 cases were, were ravens. So ravens really, really hit the pond hard that year. Um, they, they, they're smart. They figured out that snowy plovers were breeding there in high density. And what they actually will do is they'll fly over the pond. They'll look for, for adults that are, that are flushing off the pond. And then they'll go and they'll land in the area and they'll just walk around until they find the nest. And that's and you know they, it's it's pretty smart. They're you know kind of they understand what snowy plovers try to do and they and they they're pretty good at outsmarting them. In 2017 was is was when Lee Stearns actually showed up to to this oyster shell plot in Eden Landing. So it's not a surprise because um, just across the freeway um, at Hayward Shoreline is is a pretty successful uh, Lee Stearns colony managed by East Bay Parks. And then a little bit further north is uh, the colony um, at Alameda Point, which is actually the second largest colony of California lease terns in the state. So we believe that some of our lease terns showed up from these two colonies. And a little bit of background for you. Um, so we're actually in the northernmost extent of, of California lease terns breeding range. Um, historically, they did not breed in the San Francisco Bay, but they, but they bred in, um, in the Monterey Bay, um, where they no longer breed. But since the um, I believe the late 1800s, early 1900s, they've been breeding in the San Francisco Bay. Um, again, there are some differences between their, their, their habitat, depending on where you are. So coastal habitat is sandy beaches, um, sometimes lagoons. Um, whereas here in the San Francisco Bay, again, we don't really have those sandy beaches, but what we do have is a lot of salt pan. Um, we have nesting islands like at um, Hayward Shoreline. And then we also have a really large abandoned runway at Alameda Point that provides some great habitat. So there are only six locations in, this, in the San Francisco Bay where, where lease terns have, have nested in the past, past 10 years. Um, of these, clearly Alameda and Hayward are by far the most successful. And as I mentioned, um, Alameda is, is the second largest in the state in some years, uh, close to um, 350 pairs. So quite a lot of, lot of birds out there. Um, but aside from that, the other three locations, um, they're all in the North Bay. Um, they've had some good years, but in recent years, they've had some, some really tough years. Um, the situation of Napa Sonoma Marsh, um, that's right next to the Napa River and where, where the Napa River restoration occurred. Um, and they've had problems in recent years with, with river otters actually eating all of the least turn eggs and consequence, consequentially actually snowy plover eggs. So um, certainly something that was not anticipated in that situation. But uh, essentially the, you know, sort of status of all of these, these colonies is, is a bit unsure. Um, and one of the um, recovery criteria for, for California lease terns is to have three secure colonies in the San Francisco Bay. It's specifically laid out um, as an important breeding area, um, three locations um, in order to be downlisted um, to threaten. So our hope was maybe, maybe this new uh, you know, colony at Eden Landing could serve as one of those secure sites. So again, as I mentioned, they were attracted to this oyster shell enhancement. They use oyster shells at both um, at both Hayward and Alameda. And what we're thinking here, maybe, maybe snowy plovers and, and least turns are BFFs, like they're sitting next together, everything's great. All right, so maybe I'm lying a little bit. I found one snapshot of them, of them sitting next together. Um, typically though, they do get along pretty well. Um, snowy plovers and least turns are known to, to breed together, um, both in the San Francisco Bay and, and really throughout the range. They're, you know, um, Similar size, uh, similar habitat requirements, and generally get along pretty well, aside from a little bit of scuffling that you would expect from, from any breeding birds um, in close quarters. So 2017 was, was actually a really good year for, for, for lease terns. Um, we monitored um, 21 nests. Of those, we confirmed that at least 13 of them hatched. Um, and this was from anywhere from 14 to 20 pairs. Um, and we also found that um, anywhere from 20 to 28 fledglings were produced from this colony. Um, it can be a bit tough to, to determine because um, we end up getting fledglings coming through from, from Alameda and Hayward. And so this was our first year really monitoring lease turns and, and, it, and it was sort of tough to identify you know, who was who. But in any case, this is a really good year by, by lease turn colony standards. Um, one of the criteria is to have one, one fledge per pair. And so we either got close to or nearly doubled um, that statistic that year. 
Um, now, interestingly, um, snowy plovers um, were, were very much affected by, um, by, by least terns arrival. So you can see um, before snowy plover or before least terns arrived, um, snowy plovers were having another bad year. Um, out of the, the 37 nests that were, that were monitored, um, only 26% of them had hatched. So we were kind of continuing um, that trend of what we had seen in 2016 of, of just really low nest success. Now, after the least terns arrived, um, what we found is of those uh, 47 nests that we monitored, that we had a hatch rate of 70%. So the hatch rate went way up. Um, the reason for this is because um, least terns, like other tern species, will form a dense colony, um, and they will aggressively defend their, their colony against predators. And they can be pretty effective at, at chasing off avian predators, especially ravens. Um, I have witnessed this on a number of occasions. So um, what, we, what we think happened basically is that um, this least tern colony was able to kind of keep ravens off the pond. Um, as a result, um, snowy plovers fared much better. Um, based upon um, kind of nest locations and also um, I, did, I did do a little bit of GIS and, and statistical analysis, I did find that, um, that snowy plovers were, were selecting for nest sites close to the least tern colony. And so they, they appeared to recognize the benefit that it provided. And then if you look at actually some of, the, some of this data at the bottom, um, what we see is again that um, snowy plovers, the closer they were to the colony, the more successful um, nests were at hatching. So 2018, we had least terns return to E14. Um, in 2017, they'd only been there for half a year, but in 2018, they arrived um, in April. So this is kind of the earliest that, that least terns return. Um, because they are a fully migratory species. Um, unfortunately though, as you can see, there were a lot of nests, but only nine of them hatched of the 140 nests. Really, really bad year. Only nine hatched and um, anywhere from two to six fledglings from these nine, nine nests. So really, really abysmal year compared to 2017. And unfortunately, it's sort of the same story for snowy plovers. They, they had done okay before least turns arrived. And then after they show up, the hatch rate for snowy plovers actually went down. The snowy plovers again had, um, you know, ch chosen nest locations near the, near the colony, but because um, the least terns did poorly, snowy plovers did as well. Now in 2018, um, the predator that we identified as causing these problems was the red fox. It was, this was really the first year in, in, in some time that that red fox had been identified as, as a major problem for for snowy plovers uh, that we monitor, um, or, or for least terns for that matter. Um, and I should note that, that these, um, these nests that we have footage of uh, getting eaten are snowy plover nests. Um, we're not allowed to put cameras directly on least tern um, nests, but because these, these nests are relatively close to, to the least tern colony, and based upon the timing of, of, of when the nests were, were depredated, um, we, put, we feel pretty confident that, uh, that it was red fox um, that had depredated um, the vast majority of these nests. And then of course, there's also some direct evidence. We had one red fox that left scat directly in the nest. And so that provides some pretty clear evidence that that red fox had, had taken a lot of these, these least turn nests, unfortunately. So again, we did have some uh, least turns uh, come back in 2019 to Eden Landing. Um, this time um, aside, they did, they did nest in E14, but they also nested in, in some of these nesting islands in E12. Um, similarly to, to SF2, where we had um, kind of reconfigured ponds, um, the, the, the uh, ponds at, at Eden Landing have also been reconfigured, and these ponds in E12 have nesting islands. So these, these terns use these nesting islands. We monitored at least um, 41 nests. Um, unfortunately, again, a pretty poor hatch rate. Now, the interesting thing in this situation is um, they actually survived for a long time. It's not like in 20, 2018 where, where you know, they'd lay them and they'd be gone instantly. They, were, they survived a while, they started to hatch. We even had some snowy plovers that started nesting with them. Um, but unfortunately, um, really it was sort of early July that, that suddenly the whole colony collapsed. And um, based upon our sightings, um, we believe that it was actually a flock of California gulls that that had returned and, and, and just basically wiped out the colony in one fell swoop. And so essentially what we had observed looking at our data, because we do collect predator data um, every time we're out, we found that um, California gulls had not been around the ponds through June. Um, they're off breeding in their own locations, probably nearby. Um, I think the closest colony is um, in the, the, the ponds in Coyote Hills. Um, 
but it was, I think, late June, early July that we saw them um, back in the ponds nearby um, in, in pretty large numbers. And I think it's pretty conceivable that, um, you know, if a flock of these gulls lands on one of these islands, as, as they're, they're um, likely to do, that they could easily just, just take out, unfortunately, all these, all these least turn nests, all these least turn chicks. And that's, I think, what happened that year. Now, again, they did also nest at E14. Uh, we, we monitored quite a lot of nests again, um, over 100 nests. Our hatch rate was much better. We had a 33% hatch rate um, in 2019 compared to um, you know, 2018 when it was uh, you know, 10%. Um, we had at least 48 pairs. Um, but again, our fledgling rate was really, really poor. Only five to eight fledglings produced um, compared you know, to, to 2018 when we had two to six. So really more nests hatched, but basically the same result. For snowy plovers, it's, it's a, little bit, a little bit interesting because again, they had a poor year um, before lease turns arrived, uh, really low hatch rate. Um, after they arrived, um, their hatch rate went way up. Now, as I mentioned, a lot more lease turn nests hatched. So ev even though a lot of those fledglings, um, a lot of those chicks did not survive to become fledglings for lease turns, um, snowy plovers still did benefit um, from that least turn colony being around and the defense that was provided by, um, by, by, their, um, by the colony. So in 2019, we had, we had a different cast of characters um, that, that was, uh, I think, uh, the problem for, for these least turns of snowy plovers in E14. Now on the top left, um, this looks like, like some snake traps, right? Um, what, what we found in, uh, right around this time last year, um, we showed up to, uh, to you know, to E14 to do our survey and noticed that, you know, probably, you know, 10 least turn nests had gone missing and, and we have these tracks leading directly to to each of the least turn nests. And, you know, this, this is a pretty wide track. So we're thinking, well, we've got a really big snake um, that's, that's out here on the ponds. It's, 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 you know, identified and it's going out and it's eating all these eggs and chicks. Um, we started, you know, trying to figure out, we started talking with um, different wildlife trackers, with, with people with mid pen. Um, and you know, we started getting all these ideas about how we're gonna figure it out. Um, unfortunately, in that, in that meantime, um, over 4th of July holiday, um, whoever it was at that point, we didn't know, came along and depredated another 40, 50 least turn nests. So we suddenly, within the, the course of a little over a week, um, the majority of our least turn colony had collapsed. So this was really, really concerning to us. Um, after talking with um, predator control folks who work out at Eden Landing, um, they suggested that it might in fact be a skunk with a muddy tail, that it might be a skunk that walked through vegetation, walked through the marsh, tail got wet, and it eventually sort of picked up dirt, become so muddy that it wasn't able to lift it anymore and it was leaving these tracks. So sure enough, what I did is I set out a camera trap, um, kind of at a pond access point where, um, where, where we had seen some of these tracks. And, and sure enough, I got this footage of this skunk and you can see it's got this just really, really muddy tail. So in fact, was not you know one giant snake. It was skunks walking around, just picking off turn nests one by one. So we did not expect that at all. Um, but certainly, we are we are aware now that you know skunks can be a problem. Um, aside from that, we do also have quite a lot of harriers. Obviously, there's a lot of of tidal marsh um, in the San Francisco Bay, um, either that that's that's you know remnant or that's in the process of being restored at Eden Landing and elsewhere. And so harriers have really become a problem. Um, for both snowy plovers and least terns. And then lastly, um, we do have breeding um, uh, white-tailed kites at, at Eden Landing. Pretty typically we'll see um, uh, several fledglings hunting with the adults, um, and they are definitely known to be predators of both um, snowy plover and least tern adults and chicks. So, time for one more pop quiz. So who could be negatively impacted by tidal marsh restoration, and how has this been addressed? So, pond-dependent breeders and migratory birds could be affected by tidal marsh restoration. And the way that this has been addressed is by reconfiguring ponds uh, to provide habitat for multiple species. What methods have been used to improve plover and turn habitat and how successful have that been so far?
So, nesting islands, managed ponds, and oyster shell enhancements. Um, and what, what we've been able to do is we've been able to attract a lot of plovers and also terns. Um, unfortunately, it appears that, we, that we've also attracted predators to these sites. So right now we're, we're trying to figure out how we can um, kind of slow some of that down. One, one idea actually, um, what they're doing in Oregon now is, is using um, nest boxes to attract purple martins. Um, obviously, we don't have purple martins down at, at, at the tidal marsh. Um, they're mostly kind of, you know, up, up in the, the mountains surrounding us. Um, but we obviously do have a lot of swallows, um, and, and I've actually seen them chasing off harriers. And so I think one thing we might try doing in the future is installing some, some nest boxes for swallows and seeing if we can, we can get some, uh, a little bit of natural defense against harriers, at least. Last question, how has snowy plover breeding been affected by co-nesting with leaf turns at Eden Landing? All right, so snowy plovers appear to be attracted to breed close to the leastern colony. In some years, they benefit from term protection, but in other years, they, they face incre increased predation risk because of the attraction of the leastern colony. So it's kind of a mixed bag. Speaking of lease turns, so we're in the first year of a three-year lease turn social attraction project. And essentially what, what we did and what we're doing is uh, we improved habitat, um, the first weekend of March, just before everything kind of really got bad with the whole COVID situation, we were actually able to get out volunteers. Um, we, we removed um, some old um, remnant uh, salt production structures that, that are perches. We spread uh, leastern decoys. We installed a sound system. And we also put up a bunch of, of leastern chick shelters, both numbered A-frames as well as terracotta um, uh, roofing tiles, both of which uh, are commonly used uh, to provide protection for chicks. Um, it's been shown to be especially uh, effective for, um, for harriers, kites, kestrels, things of that nature. Um, peregrine falcons, I believe, as well. Um, this is at E14, and the reason is we wanted to direct the colony to an enhanced location, um, hopefully where volunteers could monitor them daily. Um, one of our problems is that we were only able to be on site really once per week, uh, most leastern colonies um, are monitored twice per week. That's kind of um, known to be sort of an, an amount of monitoring that will, will give you enough data to really know what's going on. Um, and so we thought if we, if we make the colony in a place that's near public trails where, where volunteers can monitor, hopefully we can, we can know if something, something you know, is happening with the colony and we can help uh, you know, stop it before we have that collapse that we've witnessed the past couple of years. So, Obviously, we can't really do much volunteer work right now in terms of, um, you know, kind of being close, um, but we can potentially have volunteers doing colony watch and in the future habitat enhancement events. Um, if you are interested, feel free to email me and we can, we can certainly talk more about that. Um, unfortunately, this year we've had some problems with our leastern colony um, due to predation and so the colony never really got going, um, but we're going to go back to the drawing, drawing board for next year and hopefully um, have better ne luck next year. We do also have volunteer opportunities, um, whether it be here in Santa Clara County or else, elsewhere, um, to do breeding surveys for us. If you wanna go out and, and, and do your best search for, for breeding snowy plovers, um, you can be a docent. Um, last year, I had, I had set up um, along the Bay Trail next to Crittenden Marsh and um, was able to really uh, meet with a lot of people and, and you know, share with them snowy plover information, show, show them chicks that, you know, from far away that we had banded, um, which was, you know, I think really great. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, uh, we are unable to, to, to do work out there and to have volunteers out there um, due to access right now at Don Edwards. Um, and then also eventually, when things allow, habitat restoration events that we will have in the future, including, like I mentioned, a snowy plover mud stomp, where we go out, stomp in the mud, throw oyster shells, creates nice habitat for snowy plovers, and it's a lot of fun. So last, of course, I, I have to acknowledge everyone who helped to collect this data, um, as well as all of our staff and volunteers um, from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, Rachel Turtis and Cheryl Strong, and then uh, John Krause, the, the manager of uh, Eden Landing. And with that, uh, that's the end of my presentation. So thank you very much, and I, I can take any questions we have now. Wow. <laughs> well, thank you, Ben. Uh, this is wonderful. And we do have quite a few questions. All right. Uh, 
and I will, I will read them off to you. For those people that don't know me, I'm Barry Langdon Lassane. I'm the newly elected president of the board for Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society and right-hand man for Matthew Dodder. Uh, and I'm also the tech support behind this Zoom meeting. So I'm gonna start reading off the questions from the beginning. And um, the first one is from, from Matthew Dodder. He asks, does the piping plover use the polyandrous strategy also? Ah, great question. Um, they do not, as far as I know, and here's, um, here's the big difference. Um, whether you're talking about the, the Great Lakes, um, you know, breeding population or the, um, you know, the Missouri River population or the Atlantic Coast population, the areas where they breed, um, you have much harsher um, weather and conditions. So their breeding season doesn't get going until, um, until kind of late April. Um, early May, whereas our snowy plovers, um, this year we had our first nest initiated March 10th, March 10th or March 11th. We actually had a nest in A15 um, that we found March 15th, I believe. So um, that's really the big reason that snowy plovers along the Pacific coast have this polyandrous mating system. I forgot to mention, but it's, it's sort of variable. When you look at the interior population, um, they don't necessarily have a polyandrous mating system. Sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. It's just they're dealing with, with much harsher conditions. So it's really because our, our mild weather that allows for that. Interesting. Uh, was the Kentish plover ever considered conspecific? Yes. Until 2010, um, the western snowy plover was considered a subspecies of the Kentish uh, plover. Um, it, was, it wasn't until um, some, uh, some genetic research by, um, by uh, Clemens Cooper and some other folks in, in Europe um, uh, did some genetic analysis and found that actually um, snowy plovers and Kentish plovers are, are actually less uh, closely related than, than you might superficially think. They look very closely related. Um, I believe snowy plovers are actually more closely related to lesser sand plovers, um, which, which look pretty similar, um, kind of similar as well. Um, but it's, it's kind of one of those interesting situations where, where you know, um, the, 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 the phenotypic uh, expression is not, you know, not quite the same as, as, as you know, the, the, the gene, um, you know, uh, uh, relatedness. So uh, next question. So uh, Carolyn Straub asks, can we visit Eden Landing? I think you said yes. We'd like to. Yes. So, so when you enter, um, if, if you just put Eden Landing into your, um, into your GPS, it's going to try and send you out to the middle of the ponds, which is yeah. not going to work. Uh, but basically, you're going to go on um, Highway 92. If you're coming from the East Bay, you're going to head um, uh, 92 West and get off at Eden Landing Road, um, and you'll you'll enter from Eden Landing Road, and you'll see a East Bay Parks parking lot on your left hand side, um, and that's where you'll park, and then you can walk into um, either East Bay Parks has some trails on the outer parts. Um, those are those are okay. They're kind of go along industrial parks. You want to go farther in, um, like we had done on our, our field trip last year, and and walk down the pavement. Um, walk over the pedestrian bridge, and then there's a lot of trails to see a lot of uh, a lot of great habitat that way. Excellent. So Laura asks, are there nesting areas that are partially protected during the snowy plover breeding season? I think you answered that in your presentation. Yeah, yeah. So they're um, they're fully protected. Um, so you know our habitat here in the San Francisco Bay um, is is mostly salt ponds, um, and those are obviously restricted. People are not allowed to walk on those. So we're we're lucky in the sense that we don't have to deal with human disturbance in the way that, you know, on beaches, you know, human disturbance, dogs, major, major problems, um, which is why um, they have much more robust docent programs um, to, to help protect against those issues. And that's, you know, even with all of that, they still have, you know, uh, nests that get trampled and, and things, you know, unfortunately things of that nature. Right. And Liam Murphy also adds, uh, in Santa Cruz County, they cordon off a lot of beach area. I don't think there are breeding plovers on Main Beach at the boardwalk, which you also addressed, but there are at Seabright Beach nearby. Mm -hmm. uh, but lots of attempts at protecting dunes, dogs are an issue. As you said. Yeah, yeah, so, so Seabright, those, those nests that popped up, um, it's, not, it's not usual for, for plovers to nest at Seabright. What happened is um, there was some dune restoration at Seabright um, close to the jetty. And um, they, they roped off some of the habitat, and plovers, plovers uh, uh, decided to nest there. Uh, Monterey Bay, um, a couple years ago, had met their recovery goals, and so they've got you know plovers looking for for new habitat. You know, they're sort of their their main main breeding area is sort of Sunset Beach, um, down through 
uh, down through sort of Fort Ord in um, uh, Sand City, um, Seaside area. Um, so, so they're sort of expanding out of those areas and looking for, for increased areas to, to nest. And um, those, those nests at Seabright Beach, as far as I know, failed, unfortunately. Well, that's too bad. Yeah. Uh, Matthew Daughter says, some alcid males take care of fledglings. The, Matthew's an expert, of course. They are in the same large order with plovers, gulls, etc. Is polyandry found elsewhere in this large order, charadriforms? Ah, that's a good question. Um, I'm not, I'm not actually familiar. Um, it, it's, I think it's certainly possible if you talk about, um, you know, species that are going to be found in Mediterranean climates. I think it's possible. Um, I, I'm not sure though. I, I think it's possible Kentish plovers do, um, depending upon their habitat, um, you know, because they breed um, a, a across a pretty wide range. Um, but that, that's actually one I don't know. So I'll have to look that one up. Interesting. Uh, Pete Dunton asks, is there any banding being done at Alviso? Um, Alviso proper. Um, I'm trying to think. SFBD more bands out there, right? Do they band snowy plovers? Yeah. So yeah. So so we are we are uh, just just to be clear here, we we are basically the only organization who's really doing um, snowy plover conservation work in the Bay Area. So we do all the color banding. Wow. Um, so uh, yeah. So we 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 doing all of those nests, everything we show. That's all us. So um. I don't think we've we've banded at even or at Alviso for quite some time. Um, I think we may have banded some in the small impoundment next to A12 a long time ago before I was around. Um, okay. I have banded chicks at Crittenden Marsh, um, which is yeah. right next to right next yeah. to the Alviso ponds. So yeah. hold on a sec. Um, so Pete Dutton also points out that uh, at Alviso A A14 and A15 levees, they cut down utility poles. And he was wondering, did they yeah. do that to remove perches for the peregrine falcons and the ravens to protect the snowy plovers? Yes, yes. At, at my request, um, basically, so, so what happened is um, snowy plovers have been nesting in A12 and A A13 um, when those ponds dry out. Um, but the big problem is those ponds, um, A12 and A13, are, are especially full of mercury. Um, and when you, and when you, when you dry those ponds, um, you, you basically allow them, the mercury to become methylated and to become a bioavailable form that, that can cause really big problems for, um, for, for birds, uh, for, for uh, steelhead that nest or that, that um, are nearby. Um, and so, you know, they really don't want snowy plovers nesting in those ponds, even though unfortunately it is kind of good habitat for them. So um, that year, they, they, uh, they cut a hole in the levee between A13 and A15 uh, to drain A15. Um, and it was pretty dry again this year. But, but what I had mentioned to Fish and Wildlife was, you know, there's these big perches. And it's just, you know, there's, there's just a lot of remnant wood all throughout the ponds. And as much as possible, we want to remove those because, you know, that's not going to be good habitat for plovers. So, so yes, that's why they were cut down. Wow. OK. Uh, Laura Cotney. So I wondered about the graphs that you showed. Uh, the years with no data on this graph means zero plovers were detected in the winter in Alviso. Is that correct? Yes, and that's and that's only you know during a specific date. So um, the uh, the breeding wind or excuse me the winter window is every year in the middle of January. It, it kind of changes a little bit based upon tides, um, especially for for coastal folks. Um, so it's quite possible that there were that there were some snowy plovers at some point during the non-breeding season in in Santa Clara County um, mm -hmm. during that time, but during that window survey, we did not detect any. Yes, correct. Okay, uh, Marshall Huberg says Marsha Huberg, excuse me, says my husband and I volunteer with California State Parks to help protect snowy plovers in the South Monterey Bay area. I wonder if the plovers move between Monterey Bay and San Francisco Bay, or do they pretty much return to where they hatched? And are there any studies about their movement between nesting sites? There certainly are. Um, there certainly is movement. Um, now, uh, Point Blue does, does all of the monitoring, or the, the majority of the monitoring um, in, in Monterey Bay. Um, as far as, uh, you know, uh, uh, state parks, I assume she's probably talking Fort Ord. Um, there, you know, the state parks does it, but, um, they banned almost all of their, their adults and chicks there. They've, they've kind of backed off, but yeah, we, we see their, their, um, some of their adults, uh, will eventually become, um, you know, con consistent breeders. Um, I saw, 
uh, white aqua, blue aqua yesterday. He's been breeding in, in um, Eden Landing for four or five years now. Um, he actually, I saw him uh, a few years back uh, brooding four chicks. So it does happen sometimes. And then we, we had several other um, uh, Monterey, Monterey Bay birds breeding at E14 this year. Um, who did we have? Yellow aqua, aqua yellow, uh, red aqua, aqua green. You name it, we got we got we got lots of them. So we don't see we don't see our birds down there as much because we don't have as many banded um, for a number of reasons. It's it's tougher to get out to band our chicks um, in our ponds. Um, but in any case, yeah, there is movement, um, and we did just work on a um, natal dispersal um, paper um, that uh, that point blue led, but used our data and data from others. And that was submitted to Fish and Wildlife, and I think we are going to work on a manuscript. So there will be some, um, some migration, um, uh, you know, a migration article coming out uh, in the next year or two. Excellent. Cool. Matthew and I were wondering about the weird shapes of the islands that they're putting in these ponds. Yeah. What, 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 what's the reason for the various shapes? Yeah, so, um, so the, the, first, uh, the first place where these islands were, were put in was, was both at, um, at A16 in Alviso as well as uh, at SF2 um, in, in Ravenswood. And essentially, uh, what's important to keep in mind is that the South Bay Salt Pond project is, is an adaptive management project. And so um, there isn't a roadmap for, for, for wetland restoration and for providing habitat for for all these different species. And so they essentially made all these nesting islands, different shapes, different sort of densities, uh, you know, kind of different sort of, uh, sort of crowning to try and figure out what do birds like? What are they gonna use? Um, as, as I'm sure many of you have noticed, you know, some, some nesting islands at A16 are used regularly, whether, you know, because they were, they were used by, you know, USGS had a social attraction project. Some of them, there's really nobody using those islands. Um, and so what they found is that, um, you know, they like, uh, they like certain shapes and they don't, you know, birds don't like having the nests all crammed together. So um, they learned about what shapes they like and sort of density. And so that's, that's essentially why they were kind of different shapes to start. So somebody's recording all of this information and then for future islands, they'll use that data to make better shapes? Oh, yes, yes. It's extensive, extensive research, um, mostly done by USGS. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yes, all of that all of that data went into um, uh, some of the work that was that happened at at Eden Landing um, afterwards, and then also now for Phase Two, um, uh, that's going to occur both at Ravenswood and Pond A One. Um, so uh, you know, kind of next to next to Shoreline Lake. So yeah, definitely learning as we go with that with with, with those islands. That's fantastic. Hey Barry, maybe we, should we have one more question and then and then wrap it up? Uh, sure. Let's ask this this next one, which is another great question. Why aren't you allowed to put cameras on least turn nests? <laughs> um, well, so the the uh, you know important thing to remember is uh, California least turns are listed as both federally and state endangered. Um, with that comes a much higher level um, of of you know a kind of a legal scrutiny and sort of. Uh, you know, protections that, you know, come from a good place. They, you know, want to ensure that that lease turns are being um, uh, protected. Um, so I more or less, end up, every year I end up submitting, you know, some sort of permit requests, uh, both, you know, for my federal and state permits. I did ask to be able to um, deploy uh, cameras um, on lease turn nests. And I think, I think they let me, they, they said I could get closer, but I still, you know, I'm not allowed to put Put one directly on um, on the nest. So it's it's basically about you know ensuring that that we're not going to cause a high level of disturbance. Um, probably wouldn't be an issue, but that's that, that's the rules that 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 we're given, and that's what that's what we we live by until until they change something. Okay, that um, so I Ben uh, Ben I want to thank you for your fabulous presentation. I'd love to have you back at some point to give us an update. Yeah, and I'm so looking forward to when we can go out uh, with you and see the nests, see the young, uh, for real with our own eyes, and uh, see everything that you do in that fabulous uh, site. Uh, I also like to thank you for um, localizing your presentation tonight. I know you give this presentation all over the place to many different audiences, yeah. but you work extra hard to give us uh, some Santa Clara County context, and I truly appreciate that. Thank you. 
despite that, I noticed that you're uh, you're a plover person, and I am a diehard plover person. So uh, we're <laughs> just okay. going to have to we're going to have to live with that difference. I'm afraid uh, we'll probably never agree. But um, <laughs> thank you, thank you also for all of the volunteer opportunities when they uh, when they do arise again. Please let us know. Uh, I I can I can imagine that there'll be lots of people interested in helping out with this important project. So thank you for that. And the last thing is, uh, sometime in the next day or two, send me your address. We'd like to send you a thank you for your time this evening. Uh, we really appreciate uh, all the work that went into the presentation and all the work that you're doing at that site. And so thank you so much for speaking tonight at Speaker Series for Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society. Thank you very much, Matthew and, awesome. Matthew and Barry and everyone else. I really appreciate it. Thank you for, for joining tonight. I hope everyone learned a lot. Um, feel free to, um, you know, email me offline if you have more questions. I really had not had a chance to look at any of the chats. So if anyone sent me a direct message, I didn't get a chance to look at it. Just email me directly. Happy to chat more. So then I'll send you the chat log as well, too. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Uh, stay safe. Stay healthy. And we'll talk again soon. Good night, Ben. All right. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night, everybody. You.